The Bible from 30,000 feet, soaring through the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Um, and so let's look in the, uh, uh, in your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 119, 105, 119, 105. Psalm 119, 105. This is the last of our series at 30,000 feet. And as I've done every time, I've opened the Word of God to a key text of Scripture. Psalms 119 is about the Word of God. It's about God's commands, God's Word. And this is where my journey started as a young man, is in this set of verses. And this, these set of verses mean a lot to me. It's the first verses I memorized. But in Psalms 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, uh, accept Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my own hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. As I've done every time, is I've talked to you about my hope for you this year and for NBC, is that first of all, in verses 105 and 106, it's the idea that we commit to a following heart. Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna just say this to you. There is no leadership without fellowship. Amen? And I'm gonna tell you, it, it, it is amazing to me how everybody wants to be the leader. Everybody wants to be the influencer, and nobody wants to follow. I'm going to tell you, some of the greatest people in serving God are followers. I, I told a group of pastors one time, I said, you know, the reality is everybody wants to be the pastor, but how many of you really believe that your greatest role is to be the assistant to the pastor? And I had a young man serve with me for 21 years as the associate. I, I, I praise the Lord. Carol has been serving faithfully for 21 years in this church as a behind-the-scenes supporter. And I'm going to tell you, she's done great at it. The point is, when a church decides that, you know what? I'm going to be a great follower of Jesus first, and I'm going to be, a, secondly, a great follower of the servants that God has brought that church will flourish. The problem is, is when we don't choose to follow, we don't engage. And when we don't engage, the power of the process is weakened. So I want to challenge us to say, hey, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it says there, I'm going to be a follower of your righteous laws. The, the reality is we have to commit to a following heart. The second truth that I would encourage you is this. We commit to perseverance and praise because of God's promises in this challenging world. You know, we are called to suffer, and you're going to hear that today. It is part of discipleship. The reality of true discipleship is suffering, and yet we spend our Christian life here in America trying to avoid suffering most of the time. And the reality is God wants us to be a people of perseverance, and he wants to be us, a, be a, uh, us to be a people of praise in the midst of that perseverance. And so in these challenging times, that's what God calls us to, and that's what we need to commit to. The third thing is this, is we commit to making choices in our lives that bring honor to the Lord's name no matter what others think. That's what verses 109 and 110 are talking about. No matter what other people think, we commit to bringing Him praise, Him honor, Him glory, no matter what the circumstances of our life. Folks, we, we as God's people have bitten into the heart of the world of being very circumstantial very situational in our ethics. 
And folks, when the word of God drives your heart, the situation doesn't. Amen? But so often, we let the situation drive our heart. And we let our emotions drive our heart and drive our decisions. My prayer is that you commit to bringing honor to his name, that no matter what other people think, you stand true to the truths of God's word. And then lastly is, is the last part in verses 111 and 112, and it's this, that we commit to developing a legacy of commitment to your word that reflects itself in a life of joy led by the presence of God through the, his indwelling spirit. A legacy. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be remembered in that day when they kicked, up, kicked dirt in your face? What do you want people to say? Were you a person who were committed to the word? Were you a person who was committed to following what God wanted? My hope is, is that that would be the case for you and for me. You know, we've been looking at the Bible at 30,000 feet. And we've dropped down to 20,000 feet, which we're going to do today as we conclude the New Testament. But as I've done every week, Romans chapter 15, verse 4 Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. That is what God wants, that his word brings hope. And as we understand his word, it drives a hope in our souls and our lives. So let's do a review real quick. I want us to take a look at, the, uh, at what we've been looking at. How many books of the Bible are there? Oh, come on, I want to hear you. How many? How many Old Testament? How many New? And then there are three divisions in the entire Bible, for Old Testament and New Testament. First one is foundations. There are five books. Historical books, there are 12. And instructional books, there are 22. The foundations are lived out in the historical setting. The instructional amplifies the historical setting. That's what happens in the Old Testament. The same thing is true in the New. You have four foundational books, Matthew through John. It's lived out in the historical setting in Acts. And the 22 books of Romans to Revelation is, is, is amplifying the historical setting. There are 400 silent years in between the Old Testament and New Testament, which were anything but silent. And we've talked about all of those things. So today, we're going to spend our final time in this instructional environment. We're going to talk about how this instructional environment has amplified the historical context and all that's been going on there. So let's take a look. Uh, I'll use a church to help you understand this. And I want to just kind of give you some oversights real quick. You know, in the Old Testament, we were talking thousands of years. And so there was a lot of things that happened in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we're really looking at a time frame of about 90 years. It's very tight and focused, and it's focused on Christ. Everything, the transition from Christ to his followers, the people in Acts, and then to the generations that follow that. So the instructional section of the Old Testament was about the poetry and then the warnings of the prophets. So we talked about the heart in the Old Testament, and we talked about the behavior, which was the warnings. <clears throat> in the New Testament, these are letters, or some people call them epistles, okay? And so let me ask you a question. How many of y'all remember, I know this is weird because we get emails now, but how many of you remember getting letters in the mail, all right? So, so here's my question, all right? Did, when you got a letter, did you just read the whole letter or did you just dissect every little word in each paragraph? Which one did you do? You read the whole letter. Well, guess what? There's nothing wrong with dissecting the epistles of the, or the, the letters of the, of the New Testament. There's guys that do that. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes it gets people off track. Because you got to remember, these were letters that were like written to you as a person. They were written to a church, and they're meant to be read in full. So my point is, if you read, you know, like the, the book of Ephesians, you want to read the whole letter and get a feel for it. Two or three times, read it before you start digging in deep. 
because it was intended to be a, a letter that was read to the church or read to the pastor or, or whatever the case. But it was a letter. It was a, it was a letter of compassion. It was written by different writers. And it was, it was, it was a letter of compassion uh, to help and encourage and build up and to rebuke these, uh, these different situations. So my point is, is that initially these are letters that are to be looked at as a whole picture. Now there's some big picture ideas that are true of all of these letters, from Romans to Revelation. The first one is, is all of them look back to the cross. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. What are the implications? That's what's being written here. What are the implications of the one who came, Jesus Christ? What are those implications? And how do those implications affect us? How do they affect me? So they, they, Jesus lived a short life. He invested truths into us. He commissioned us. He was crucified. He was buried and he rose again and he's alive today. What are the implications in our lives regarding that? So this is how, as you look at the oversight here, that's kind of what's going on here. The second big picture idea is they emphasize Christ's death and resurrection. That was huge in every one of these letters. His death and resurrection was huge. Also, they highlighted fulfilled promises of the Old Testament. A lot of times, they would, they would be, uh, these letters, the, the writers would write to the churches, and the church in the very beginning was Jewish. And so when they would write, they had a great sense of the Old Testament. And so as they'd write, they'd quote the Old Testament, or they'd talk about Old Testament truths in contrast to the new life in Christ Jesus. And, and it would be like the people would be reading that letter or hearing that letter, and they would go, oh, 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 that's what that means. You see, so the point is, there's great clarity that comes about Christ in these things. The other thing that's really big here is that the, uh, these letters are the source of doctrine and theology. Now, those are big words, and most of the average Christian is usually scared of those words. You shouldn't be scared of them. Doctrine is the practice of theology. Theology is simply the study of God. That's what that means. It's simply saying, this is what we've learned about God. Now, how do we live for God? And that's all the theology and doctrine is. And so what, what happened here is that the church was birthed. And you've got to remember something. The, think about a new birth. Think about a baby. That's what the church was. It was a baby, and it was learning to grow. Okay? And so when these letters came, they were helping the church understand how to grow, just like you and I have to learn how to grow. Amen? It's no different. It's just... And, and so they needed to learn things to grow up well. They needed to learn how to get healthy as churches. And the church, uh, they, they learned from Peter and Paul and John and Jude and James and the unknown writer of Hebrews. So uh, they began to write in these church scenes. They began to talk to them about their congregations, about the communities of faith to help them sort out how they to operate in their cultures. It's no different for you and I. How do we grow up as a church and learn how to operate in our culture? And these are truths that are past us. What they did, how they believed, how they faced persecution, how they handled problems, how to encourage one another, how to be aware of false teaching. All of this was engaged into these epistles to help them to grow up. These are key truths. And then it spoke to all, these things had, uh, had not been dealt with before. Don't ever forget that. Think about a baby who's learning new things as they grow. These are things they're like, wow, we've never heard this before. Remember I told you before that you know, the church, that was a whole new concept. They had the tabernacle and the, and the temple. This whole concept of church, ecclesia, gathering, they were like, what is this all about? How do we do this? How do we function? And so these epistles were giving them amplified information on how to do church, how to live, how to be about the mission that Christ had left, you know, the great commission and the great commandment. These epistles also, these letters also underscore the new life in Christ Jesus. That you're not the old person. You're not part of that, that old life. You are a new in Christ Jesus. It's really cool. And then 
uh, many times they would get insight, as I said earlier, to the Old Testament teachings. And so that was healthy. But also another key part of these letters was faith was center stage. You say, well, faith is not a concept, folks. Faith is a function, okay? Faith is when I trust, when I step, and I say, God, I believe in you more than I believe in me. Faith is not just an idea. It's not a blind leap. Anybody who thinks faith is a blind leap, you don't understand faith. Faith is based on information. It's based on evidence. And faith is trusting in a person, not in a concept. Faith is in the person of Jesus Christ and believing in him and trusting him. So a lot of things here uh, are about faith as center stage. For in fact, in Ephesians, it says, by grace through faith you are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because faith was so great, prayer was so powerful. When we pray, we are saying, God, not only do I believe in you, but I need you, and I need you to engage. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Word of God is constantly talking about this faith piece of trusting God. So another key part is this, is suffering. And I said this earlier. Suffering is, is the sense of, is really the aspect of discipleship in these epistles. See, we, we, we live in a world that doesn't want suffering. And I'm telling you, suffering is a part of believing in Christ. If you truly want to be a follower of him, it will cost you. And these epistles are very clear about that. And for, for us, we tend to have a very small view of that, okay? Because we feel very safe here. But the reality is, the world that we live in is suffering all the time. Right now, in Myanmar... There are issues going on in Myanmar regarding this very thing. So my challenge to you is this. Remember that part of truly being a disciple is it costing us, okay? And then another key piece is the danger of false teaching. There is a, um, a great section, many sections in these epistles that talk about the issue of false teaching because as this church began to grow, as they began to learn, as they began to, to develop, there were those who came in and tried to pull them back. The whole book of Galatians is about uh, the idea that, that we can't let the Judistic laws dictate how we live our Christian faith. And so what, what it is, is, is be careful of false teachings. And so the, the great tool that Satan uses is the tool of false teaching. And you got to remember something. Counterfeit looks like the truth. Don't ever forget that. Counterfeit seems very real. Okay? I mean, many of us are very smart. We, we know what bad looks like. That's not your greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy is the diversion of truth, okay? And so these epistles address this. These letters address this in a very, very big way. So let's jump into this. This is a church, and uh, this is, as we talked about, the birthing of the church. And so how are these books laid out? How are they divided? Well, first of all, there's a foundation. The foundations are the four gospels, which we've talked about before. And then the second layer of the foundation is the historical, the book of Acts. So everything is built upon what's happening here, all right? But then as you break out this section of letters, what, you, what you'll find is this, first of all, we have the structure of the, of the church, but then over on this side, you have Paul's letters to the churches. There are nine letters to the churches. Now, understand that these letters are intended to the whole body, okay? They're intended to go to the whole church. They're intended to be read to the church. The foundational cornerstone of these nine letters is the book of Romans, and it's right here. It's it lays the foundation, and these keys in the book of Romans are played out in all of these books up to 2 Thessalonians. So all of the books from 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, have elements of the book of Romans in them. 
And it lays out the foundational truths. It lays out how they are to function as a church. They are the letters to the churches. They are instructions on how they live, how they carry on everyday business, a being what is called a community of faith. It's a cool thing. How do we do this? How do we, how do, we do this thing called church? And I think that's something that, that people don't, re, don't realize is how new this was to the people who came to faith. This whole concept of church was like a brand new thing. You talk about living by faith. This is what God has called every one of us to do. And sadly, we've gotten too used to the routine. Does that make sense? We like the routine too much. Folks, whenever you feel like the routine is normal, get yourself out of it. Amen? Get yourself out of it. Try something new. Step out in a new way. Ask God. Start praying. Say, God, give me a new adventure. That's what I challenge the staff. That's why Carol, God is just blossoming in Carol's life. But she's, he, he's doing it in other people's. And the, the point is, is that God is saying, you want to be where God is at work. Amen? Folks, this life can be pretty boring if we're not where God is at work. Amen? And that's what's going on here. So, so the first part is called, these are called the Pauline letters or the Pauline epistles. Now, there's another set of letters, and these letters are over here, and these are general letters to believers. And there are nine of those. You didn't realize the New Testament was so balanced, did you? There are nine letters to these. They, are, they were written by James and Peter and John and Jude and the writer to Hebrews, um, they're not, they're, like I said, they're not from one author, they're from many, but these are general letters. They're addressed to believers, and the cornerstone is Hebrews. Hebrews is the cornerstone to these letters, and it is lived, the principles of Hebrews are seen in these letters here, okay? And so there is a constant flow of new teaching of, 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 to the believer himself, Okay? These are more personal in nature. They are more uh, speaking to the individual and giving individual instruction for individual ideas and reasons. So the, uh, and then thirdly, there are letters to the leaders. And I put those up here, leaders from Paul to the leaders. And these books are uh, the books that kind of capstone everything, okay? These books, these letters are 1 Timothy to Philemon. They cap the house. They cap the, the church. And as we've talked about before, all things rise and fall on leadership. First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon. These are the letters to the leaders of the churches. And as we've talked, as, as I've said, as a leader goes, so goes the church. This is the development of elders. Elders are qualified men that God has asked to oversee and lead the church by example. They are there to be the, the, the shepherd, the body, to come alongside the shepherd leader, the pastor, and, and together shepherd the body, lead, be the example of oversight, be the encouragers, be the builders of the body, be the ones who are saying, are helping launch the charge. Way too much in America, we put the emphasis on this pulpit and on the pastor standing here. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it is much broader than me. It is much broader than the pastor that stands in this pulpit. It takes leaders. It takes more if the body of Christ is going to be effective fulfilling the great commission of building and developing disciples. Amen? Elders are teachers. They, uh, they give direction to the churches and the situations. And so as I said before, as leadership goes, so goes the people. So that truth still holds to today. Now, there are differences, and I want to just kind of give you a sense of differences between these sides. And the first set of differences is this, that this side, these books, this avenue is about community. They talk a lot about community and about what it means to be a community of believers versus this side, these are more about individuals, okay? that we're dealing more with individuals. The second thing is that these are birth books. These books are about birth. They're about foundations. They're about the things that help the church to become strong and, uh, and legitimately building up 
They are very connected to these books here, but this is growth. These books are about growth. How do I grow up? How do I, how do I understand more mature concepts? How do I develop myself? The third aspect is, is this side is about teaching, and this side's about applying. Okay? Very much about teaching doctrines and foundations. This side is about applying. So these are kind of the differences between these books. Then also, the, 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 uh, this side here is about principles and about practice. Kind of similar to the other, but this is foundational principles, and this is about the practice. So this is a, the left side is about what we drive from, and this is how we put it into life, okay? And then the next part is the left side is very much about doctrine, about doctrine, and very much about the right side is very much about the practical application of, of putting God's word into practice. And then the, four, the next one is the left side is about justification, which is actually salvation. Salvation means justification. How am I justified before God? And God tells us that we are justified just as if we never sinned. How does that happen? It happens through salvation. How are we saved? How are we rooted in Christ Jesus? How do we become a child of God? And then the right side is about sanctification. It's about how can I help my life to follow Christ out of a thankful heart? You've heard me say this over and over again. Sanctification is, is, is that idea of being set apart, which the Bible says is the definition of holiness, Okay. We are, God said, be holy for I am holy. And so as we set apart, as we come out, how do I live a life that is separated but thankful and one that rejoices in the mercy and grace of God? And how do I live that out in a thankful way? So these are the, uh, and this is the, I think, is there one more? No, okay, so we're good. So this is helping the churches to renew, to have birth, to have a healthy base on the left side. This is about churches. This is about discipleship. So mainly these books are discipling. These books are about churches. When I go into a church and I um, help churches to begin to get healthy and foundational and, and to get visionary about their new purposes, we talk about this left side. We deal with the church, and we try to get them in the birthing aspect. I went uh, in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we, we, there's a lot of energy in birth. And so in the book of Ephesians, for example, uh, we deal with who are we and what has God called us to be. And if you remember right, when I first came here, I spent a lot of time in, in, uh, in the book of Ephesians with the leadership, with the church. What are we doing? We're talking about who we are. Remind ourselves who we are and what we're called to be. And so we lay foundations. The book of Galatians is, is, uh, deals with legalisms, and Philippians deals with attitude shifts. How do I shift my attitude from one thing to the other? Um, and then Colossians deals with the centrality of Christ. That's all on this side, and it's all of that birthing move. Let's go ahead and run the arch. Um, and so what we're dealing with here is this idea of the church birthing and growing and becoming more mature, and then, then it, it started to have challenges, just like every one of our lives. And so these right-hand books are very much about warning. Again, remember just how the prophets of the Old Testament did warnings? Well, guess what? The New Testament, there's warnings of false teaching. There's warnings, warnings of faith. There's warnings of your tongue in the book of James. There's warnings of you moving away from, from that which Christ has called us to. And see, folks, this is a, a cycle that happens for not only our lives. I mean, think about it. We're born we grow, we become mature, and then all of a sudden we start fading and we end up dying, right? Well, guess what? That's what happens to churches too, okay? And these books are designed that way. These are about growing and birthing and revisioning and refoundations and making things anew. And then this side here is about the warnings of staying on track, getting back on track. Does that make sense, church? Let me show you how I do this when I coach churches. Same concept. 
but it's this truth here. On this side of the curve, you dream, you have beliefs and goals and structure and effective ministry, and all these things are birth, growth, and maturity. But then things maintenance, plateau, they decline in death, and there's apathy and questioning and polarization and imploding. And you know, when these things start happening, not only does the church need warning, not only does the church need revitalization, but it also is for us as believers to say, look, let's get back onto faith. Let's get back onto trusting God. Let's get back. Things become routine on that right side. They become habitual. Uh, there's a chance that there are problems that, that don't get solved when things get like that. Uh, there's a decline. Hebrews to Revelation talks about warnings. Revelation is about warning. James is about warning about faith. Peter is warning about staying persevering during suffering. And John is talking about having good fellowship and getting renewed with one another. And Jude uh, is talking about losing the ability to contend for the faith. All of these are warnings to get back to where we need to be. My role here has been to help you get back on this side to redream. My goal here is to help you as a church to redream and say, God, what is it that God has for NBC for such a time as this? Folks, you got to get out of the past. And I mean it. Get out of it. The past is not where God is at work. God is at work today. Be about what he's doing today. And the question is, is your heart open enough to say, God, whatever you want me to do today is what I want to be a part of. So often we get stuck. We try to preserve the past. We're trying to hold on to it. We're trying to keep it so that we can feel safe and secure and that we've got it all figured out. Folks, you don't have it figured out. God is a living God. Christ is alive. He is constantly moving his church to new waters, to new pastures, to new opportunities. Amen? Are you willing to be a people of faith that will take that journey? It starts with you individually, and then it goes to you corporately. And if you're willing to do it individually, the corporate piece is no problem. Amen? So when you look at something happening like in Carol's life, where God is taking her onto a new adventure, I know there's a tear. I know it's like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And then there's the, wow, but I'm excited for her. Right? Amen? It should be the same tension in your life every day. See, that's the part. We don't see that as normal, and it should be. What is God doing in your life today? Maybe you're here today, and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Maybe that tension is, do I, can I trust God? Can I believe in Him? Can I step out in faith enough to believe that He's at work and that He's going to change my life? Can I do that? Can I step out in faith and receive him as Savior and say, I believe that you died on the cross for me, were buried and rose again, and you're alive today, and you want to set my feet upon into a new relationship with the Almighty. Maybe that's the step of faith you need to take. But church, maybe the other step of faith is you looking in the mirror and saying, God, I received you at this age or this age or this age. Am I really engaged to what you're doing in my life today? Am I listening to you? Am I praying? Am I, am I engaging with your activity so that I step out in faith today? Or am I just content to ride, ride the wave of others until I get to heaven? Folks, getting in the Word of God, reading it yourself, getting into Bible studies, connecting with the church getting into these prayer clusters, praying and saying, God, in my sphere of influence, how can I be your servant, your hand in my world? Show me, Lord. Child of God, you are not here by accident. You are here for a purpose, and God wants to work in and through your life for his glory. Amen, church? Will you be a people of faith? Can you contend for the faith? Do you know the word of God enough? Is your tongue creating blessings or cursings? Because that's what the New Testament talks about. So I warn you, church. I warn you. 
if we as God's people do not lean in to Jesus Christ and understand who he is better by his word, you will miss opportunity. You will. God will raise up someone else. If he doesn't raise up you, he'll raise up someone else. Church, rise. It is time for Mesa Baptist to be the most shining light in this community. Amen? Father, we love you. I pray your blessings on this church. I pray your blessings on its people. And I pray that, Father, together and individually, we would bring you glory. I pray, Father, for those who need you as Savior, that, Lord, they would say yes to you today, and they would reach out and say, yes, Lord, I need you. And for your glory and for your praise, we will give you all the glory. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a guiding light to our lives, a lamp unto our feet, and a light to our path. God, may that path be so shining with you and your word that we step into new opportunities for your glory and your praise. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you, church. We're